Sharkoon Night Sharkarji BPC Case Review. The Verdict. What's Hot? Decent support for cooling solutions The case is decent for those who like RGB with the controller included that's already mounted The use of tempered glass is really good as well. What's not? Lack of cable management channels Difficult placement of the CPU power cutout. So after all that I can happily recommend the Sharkoon Night Shark as a smart looking case for those on a relatively tighter budget. It comes with a RGB controller tempered glass and three RGB fans included too. This case is currently retailing for 89.99 over at CCL Computers at time of writing, and for the features included it's a pretty competitive price. I enjoyed building in the case but as I have mentioned the lack of management channels and the placement of the cutout for the CPU power cables made part of the process a bit finicky and difficult but this wasn't enough to put me off. MSI Trident X, i7-9700K and RTX 2080, System Review MSI's Trident line of PCs has been around for some time now, and it is known for cramming the latest hardware into very small packages. That is exactly what we get with the Trident X we are reviewing today, as it uses both the Intel i7-9700K and NVIDIA RTX 2080 in a case that has a total volume of just over 10 liters. For 2699 what compromises, if any, have been made, and is it worth buying? Considering the fast hardware used inside this diminutive chassis, it is very impressive that the Trident X stays as cool and quiet as it does, if you stick this under your desk when gaming, you will hardly be able to hear the fans spin. Coming from the Aegis 3 which proved a bit whiny, the Trident X is overall very easy on the ears, which is again impressive considering the small nature of the machine. For me, this machine ticks all the boxes, it is good looking, very compact, fast, while it also runs cool and quiet. If I were to nitpick, yes. It is a strange decision to have the tempered glass panel mounted to the right hand side of the case, while I would have also preferred the RAM to have some kind of heat spreader instead of the plain green PCB dims used here, though that is very minor as the RAM is all but obscured by the CPU cooler. The biggest drawback, however, is the pricing. At 2699 the Trident X is not ridiculously overpriced but according to my calculations it is around 700 more expensive than building a similar system yourself. We can usually expect a premium of maybe 300 to be added to a pre-built system, considering it is built, shipped and covered by warranty for you. I also appreciate you are paying for the smaller form factor with the Trident X, but even so, a markup of 700 is a bit steep. That being said, the MSI Trident X is still a mighty fine machine, like I said, it ticks all the boxes for me. If you are looking for a compact and all-round impressive system, this will do you very nicely. You will just have to accept the fact that you are paying a fair bit more than the total cost of the components. Pros Very Compact Fast Hardware Inside Thermal performance is not a problem despite the small size of the machine. Very quiet for a gaming PC. Off the shelf hardware so no difficulty to upgrade down the line. Cons tempered glass panel on the right hand side of the machine seems odd. Plain green PCB memory. A fair bit more expensive than the total cost of all the components. AMD Radeon RX 590 Roundup, Power Color. Sapphire and XFX. The Radeon RX 590 is the latest and greatest mainstream graphics card from AMD and is targeted at targeted to 1080p gamers that want to play every game on the market today at respectable frame rates for under $300. You also get 3 PC games for free when you purchase the RX 590, Devil May Cry 5, The Division 2, and Resident Evil 2 to help sweeten the deal.
In our launch day review we looked at the XFX Radeon RX 590 Fatboy and have since gotten in the power color Red Devil AX RX 590 as well as the Sapphire Nitro Plus Radeon RX 590 Special Edition. After spending a couple weeks using the AMD Radeon RX 590 on our gaming test platform we are happy to report that all did really well at 1080p and 1440p gaming. The three models that we looked at today are very similar in design and none really stood out from the pack when it came to performance or features. None had any glaring defects and the performance between the cards was insurmountable to tell during gaming. We noticed temperature differences, but the target temperatures were factory set to differently. It's hard to compare temperatures of these three cards when they are designed to run at the target temperature. Overclocking was our last hope at trying to get any one of the cards stand out from one another and that two failed to show a difference. The top clock frequency on all three cards was basically the same and performance was within a percent of one another. So. What card do you buy? The best bang for the buck are the Power Color Red Devil Radeon RX 590, $279.99 shipped, and the XFX Radeon RX 590 Fatboy, $279.99 shipped, since they cost the least. The Sapphire Nitro Plus Radeon RX 590 Special Edition runs $318.60 shipped. The Sapphire Nitro Plus Radeon RX 590 had the best gaming performance thanks to the overclocked memory, but it didn't make the card significantly faster and you couldn't feel any difference while gaming between the three models. The Sapphire car did look pretty good with the blue LED fans. But is that worth paying an extra $39 or 14% for? The other big factor in purchasing video cards is the warranty length. Power Color and Sapphire both back their custom AMD Radeon RX 590 cards with a two year warranty. XFX is the only one of the three companies in this roundup to offer a three year warranty. That means XFX's Radeon RX 590 model has the lowest price and the longest warranty of the bunch. Gaming and overclocking performance is a wash between all these models, so it looks like XFX offers the best value of these three cards. It ran the hottest at 80C, but you can always reduce the target temperature in AMD Wattman or Edith of BIOS to lower that if you'd like. We know this isn't a super exciting conclusion, but that is what happens when AMD refreshed the same GPU core not once, but three times. MSI GeForce RTX 2080 Gaming X Trio Review The GeForce RTX 2080 has its own GPU called the TU-104. This card will get 2944 shader processors also referred to as stream or CUDA cores, active based on that TU-104 GPU running a base clock of 1515 MHz with boost frequencies running upwards to 1800 MHz. The TU-104 chip contains 6 GPCs, 48 SMs, and 8 32-bit memory controllers, 256-bit total. Each SM includes 64 shader processors, 256 kilobytes register file, 96 kilobytes L1 data cache, shared memory cache, and 4 texture units. The full TU-104 chip contains 13.6 billion transistors and includes 3072 shader processors, 368 tensor cores, and 48 RT cores. So yes, the RTX 2080 is cut down. 1x8 NVLink link is activated providing 25 gigabytes per second of bandwidth in each direction, 50 gigabytes per second total bandwidth. Keep in mind that the clocks and TDPs will be different here and there, A partners obviously have different factory tweaked products. The GDDR6 memory will get tied to a 256-bit bus and depending on the clock frequency, 
we are looking at 448 gigabytes per second it is a product that should start at 699 US dollars for the eight partner products and 799 for the founders editions in this review however we look at a more high-end offering the MSI Force RTX 2080 gaming X trio the graphics card comes with an all-new twin frozer based cooler which is very silent once powered on it offers a seriously nice look with some RGB integration, the temperatures remain cool, but most of all it does all that combined with a really serious factory tweak in place. This card offers an out-of-the-box clock frequency of 1860 MHz, and that is fairly serious really. The memory, Micron GDDR6, clock runs reference at 14 Gbps. The cooler is dual slot triple fan design. The card comes fitted with two power headers, both 8 pin. Connectivity wise, you'll spot one HDMI ports and three Display Port outputs, as well as the new Virtual Link USB connector for VR purposes. This Turing 104 GPU empowered product keeps that factory tweaked GPU at roughly 64 degrees Celsius marker depending on game load. Though the GDDR6 memory has been not been tweaked, the new Micronics are stock 14 GHz, effective clock rate, but can be bumped upward towards 16 GHz with a flick of your fingers and our afterburner overclocking software. Have a quick peek above and then dive into the full review. We have a thing or two to show you alright, let's commence this review, shall we? The good news is that MSI is able to offer a competitive price compared to other aid products, the bad news is that the card still is in that 849 euros, price range, arguably that is a massive amount of money for the RTX 2080 series. The biggest problem is that the Founder Edition cards have become much more competitive with their competing clocks and cooling design. Since the Founders cards sell at your 799, the extra 50 bucks remains hard to justify. This is a problem that Nvidia created themselves, as they are now competing with their board partners. Low availability isn't helping either. Pricing is off for the RTX 2080 series. Relatively speaking among the Abe cards, MSI manages this product well, being competitive pricing-wise. The PCB layout and component usage are good, the cooler I would qualify as excellent even. Palette really did design a card that works really well, proper cooling at a very low acoustic level. The factory tweak is nice but we're talking about 2% extra performance at best compared to the Founder Edition cards. That is the reality these days. Tweaking wise the card did not disappoint though. Combined with that lovely and totally silent cooling and a really nice factory tweak we'll hand out a top pick award, as the product they MSI has released here really deserves that award. Albeit being hindered by a too high overall market price segment. It is a superbly designed product. ASRock Z390 Phantom Gaming 9 Review The ninth generation of core processors from Intel has arrived, though finding chips in stock is still a little tricky. By now, the performance of the new platform is well documented. The i9-9900K has thoroughly taken the trophy for fastest gaming CPU, but not for being the most cost-effective. Given Intel's focus on the gaming market for this release, it is only fitting that motherboard manufacturers follow suit. ASRock in particular has introduced the new Phantom Gaming line of boards featuring 2.5 gigabit LAN capabilities. Before I get into what makes the Phantom Gaming special, I will briefly outline the improvements to the Z390 chipset as a whole. First. USB 3.1 Gen 2 is now natively supported, where on the Z370 chipset, motherboard manufacturers would need to use third-party storage controllers. The second major change is Convy support, which is Intel's high-speed wireless solution. 
The 2x2 two two 802.11 acres connection boasts up to 1.73 gigabits per second throughput. The Z390 chipset is compatible with 8th gen core processors as well. The ASRock Z390 Phantom Gaming 9 I have here today is the flagship of this new lineup. The board boasts a full coverage M.2 heatsink, dual gigabit LAN, and ASRock Hyper BCLK Engine 2. Not only are there 3 M.2 slots, but 8 SATA 6 gigabits per second ports, of which 2 ports are powered by an additional AS Media Controller. The feature ASRock is most excited to present, and rightfully so, is the new Phantom Gaming 2.5 gigabits per second LAN. The new hardware ops throughput potential by a theoretical factor of 2.5 over Intel gigabit offerings, and the software utility will let gamers prioritize gaming traffic for better latency as well. The ASRock Z390 Phantom Gaming 9 is a bold take on ASRock's tried and true motherboard formula. The ASRock Z390 Phantom Gaming 9 proves to be a capable board with killer good looks. Small changes, like moving the M.2 heatsink from the top slot to the bottom one in order to position it for better airflow, and better aesthetics, lead to an overall improvement on an already rock-solid, time-tested template I have come to know from ASRock boards in the past. The Phantom Gaming theme is attractive, but still neutral enough to match a large range of components and color schemes. ASRock's BIOS is detailed and easy to navigate, and their software is concise. Memory stability was also great, and it is good to see that ASRock is still prioritizing performance and compatibility with their boards. CPU overclocking went about as I expected, matching the other two boards I have tested with this i9-9900K sample. ASRock has plenty of tweaking built into these boards to keep even the most avid enthusiasts occupied. ASRock has a history of providing premium LAN connectivity at a relatively low price point, and it is good to see the brand expanding that with this new Phantom Gaming 2.5 gigabit LAN offering. While the number of buyers who can fully take advantage of these features is quite low, that number is increasing rapidly. Furthermore, the LAN tuning software that is bundled with the Phantom can offer significant advantages even to users who cannot yet approach the bandwidth limits of this board. I do have a few small concerns. While I commend ASRock for not jamming every conceivable piece of software they can onto their driver disk, it does still contain some bloat. A tuning or the Phantom Gaming skinned version of it is not included and I think it should be. This is a nitpick as it is easily available over ASRock's website, and while it is useful, it is certainly not necessary. My biggest issue with the Phantom Gaming 9 is the price. At $269.99, the Gaming 9 is just $30 cheaper than the ASRock Z390 Taiki Ultimate. The two boards are almost identical, Aside from looks, the biggest difference is the LAN. The Taiki Ultimate has full 10 gigabit as opposed to the Phantom Gaming's 2.5 gigabit. With all that said, the ASRock Z390 Phantom Gaming 9 is an excellent performer in all categories and has a much bolder aesthetic than the Taiki line. Additionally, 2 gigabit internet is starting to become more common here in North America while 10 gigabit is still a way out. Therefore, I can comfortably recommend the ASRock Z390 Phantom Gaming 9 to anyone looking for a high-end Z390 board for gaming. ASRock X399 MTAGI Review, TR4 Goes Tiny. Despite its surprising combination of a compact micro ATX form factor and well-established powerhouse X399 chipset, the ASRock X399M, currently $299, $233 on Nuke, with an extra $20, 30 rebate to sweeten the deal.
delivers spot-on performance in line with larger boards. And there's plenty of potential for overclocking if that's your thing. However, those looking for the monster threadripper build experience with loads of graphics cards and high-speed storage should look elsewhere. The ASRock X399 MTAKI performs just as well as its larger ASRock sibling boards, and sacrifices connectivity, expandability, and some aesthetics to cram X399 into the micro ATX form factor. Putting aside the purest in me, this board makes sense from a value perspective. If all you're looking for is cores and speed, the added benefit of GI, DIMMs, and arguably storage is well worth the exclusion and cheaper price tag. At MSRP, this board squeaks by the larger Taiki by only $Rust 10 which is insignificant given the price of the rest of the hardware. However, taking sales prices at the time of this publication, a savings of $Rust 20 could be the difference in a cooler selection, additional NVM capacity, or even bumping up GPU tiers. Given our analysis of all the X399 boards from ASRock, the shared VREG cooling solution almost makes it essential to get a monoblock for extreme overclocking or prolonged high load use cases, so that $20 savings might be helpfully spent toward a custom cooling loop. We put this tiny Taiki board through more than our usual spate of tests. And while a compact Max Threadripper solution originally didn't hold a whole lot of interest, the X399 M Taiki opened our eyes to the possibilities of building a compact powerhouse PC. ASRock delivers full-sized performance in a smaller package at a price that is more palatable for a builder looking to dive into the head scene. ASUS ZenBook 13 UX331 An Ultrabook Review ASUS has been a serious contender for the best ultra portable that isn't made by Apple for some years now. Its ZenBook range has regularly impressed with its looks, features, performance and value. The UX331 UN is the latest 13 inches model in the classic range, which means it doesn't flip into tablet mode or incorporate a touch screen. Yet, despite weighing just 1.12 kilograms, it still comes with discrete graphics. The Asus ZenBook 13 UX331 UN comes in two colors, gray or blue. You can also specify it with either an Intel Core i5 or i7 from the 8th generation, KB Lake R. Our sample used the Core i5-8250U, with the Core i7-8550U the other option, although both are quad-core. There's a reasonable 8GB of RAM, but the really surprising inclusion is discrete NVIDIA Force MX150 graphics, which comes with its own 2GB complement of GDDR5 memory. The Asus ZenBook UX331 UN is a phenomenally good ultra-portable. It has class-leading battery life when you need it, but also very respectable processor and graphics capabilities when you need those too. It's also extremely light and thin, and it looks great too. There are a few niggles. The trackpad, as always, could do with being a centimeter to the left to minimize stray pointer movement, and the keyboard takes a little getting used to if you're a fast touch typist. It would also have been useful to have a full-sized SDXC memory card reader. But when you consider the total package, these are very far from being deal breakers. The screen is also bright, clear, and not as badly affected by bright conditions as some. Best or all, you can pick the ZenBook 13 UX331 UN up for $999. If you're after super light notebook that can last all day on battery, then do some serious processing work and gaming when you get back home to the AC power, this ZenBook comes highly recommended. Pros Excellent Battery Life Great graphics performance for an ultra portable. Great multi threaded CPU performance for an ultra portable. Thin and light. Good looking, fingerprints aside, crisp IPS display. Decent array of ports for the size, including full sized HDMI. 
Harman Kardon speakers a cut above the average for thin and light format. Cons, micro SD memory cards only. SATA 3 SSD, not NV. Trackpad prone to accidental pointer movement when touch typing. Keyboard needs getting used to. Chassis lid finish attracts fingerprints. HP Spectre Folio 13 Review, Leather Clad Convertible. Let's get right to the obvious. The HP Spectre Folio 13 is covered in leather. Like a football, a handbag, or the interior of a car. It's a bold expression of the convertible laptop as not just a tool, but a fashion statement. The Folio, $1,299.99. $1,499 to start, $1,758.98 as tested, is also priced like a premium fashion statement. And while its LTE capability lets it connect to the internet from almost anywhere, the Y-Series processor isn't great for sustained performance. Love it or hate it, HP is doing something new and interesting with its use of leather as a primary material on the Spectre Folio 13. It's divisive, sure, but it's also innovative both in terms of aesthetics and physical design. There are still some design hiccups to be worked out, but the device largely works as intended. It also boasts a nice screen and long battery life. Of course, the big question is one of taste. The leather chassis will either draw your interested eye or make you go running for a more traditional metal ultra portable. If you're looking for better performance than the Y series processor and the Spectre Folio, Microsoft's Surface Pro 6 is your best bet. The tablet and detachable keyboard are similar to the Folio, but HP's laptop doesn't detach, which actually makes it more stable to use as a traditional laptop. While you'll lose about an hour or so of battery life with the Surface, their U-Series processors offer stronger sustained performance. But for simpler tasks and entertainment, if new materials draw you in, the Folio is worth a look. It may look like an old-school, leather-bound notebook, but it sure isn't your parents' laptop. A look at Intel Core i9-9900K workstation and gaming performance. There's a lot to like about Intel's Core i9-9900K that goes beyond adding 33% more cores over last year's i7-8700K. The 9900K can peak at 5 GHz, and barely throttles back when all 8 cores are engaged. Add to that the introduction of Solder Tim, a chip like the 9900K has been a long time coming, so let's dive in. As soon as AMD released its first Zen-based processors in the spring of 2017, many people began to wonder, what's Intel going to do to keep things interesting? Well, while the company has been struggling to get its DIN nanometers products at the door in wide volume, it's been in a privileged situation where it has had the capability to strike back. That's not a reality afforded to many. Not long after Risen launched, we saw Intel introduce Core X series months later. Suddenly, 10 core processors didn't seem so impressive. Instead, we have 18 core processors today at the ready, with the promise of a 28 core Xeon to come soon. It's probably safe to say that the idea of owning a 28 core Xeon could be scrapped unless you plan on spending many thousands of dollars on only the CPU. There are many things to like about Intel's 9th Gen processors. The fact that they're simply better than the 8th Gen is enough for me to be happy, because for so long, it was hard to get truly excited about CPUs. I think we owe AMD thanks for spurring Intel on, but Intel's been doing a great job at executing its rebukes. After the i7-8700K came out, I couldn't help but immediately feel a little underwhelmed by its 6 cores. It's not that 6 cores are poor by reasonable standards, but Intel already had a 10 core enthusiast chip before it. Here we are today, a mere year later, with another 2 cores for the top end mainstream chip. Bear in mind, 
the i7 7700K was a quad-core processor, and that was tops of the 7th Gen Core series. And not to mention the more than 10 years worth of generations before it, 2009's Core i7-975 was also quad-core while the first from Intel was 2007's Core 2 Quad Q6600, a chip that cost $S851 at its release, while I felt 6 core was a bit lacking with the 8700K, I feel like 8 cores with the 9900K is a definite sweet spot. That is to say, it's not overkills for most people, but it still offers a lot of grunt to get good work done. For those trying to maximize their dollar, the enthusiast platforms have simply not been a great option. And even now, I suppose that the 9900K is not that cheap, considering this 8-core costs at least $100 more than last year's 6-core. Intel is clearly charging a premium for its 9900K, but it's a premium product. It'd be a little insulting if the 9900K was the only 8-core of the 9th gen, but it isn't. The i7-9700K is specced similarly to the 9900K, it drops 100 MHz on the turbos, 4 MB off the level 3 cache, and forgoes hyper-threading. But it does all that for a similar price as last year's 8700K so at least those splurging the same amount of money today are going to get more value than they would have last year. There are a couple of other highlights surrounding the 9900K, such as its domination in scenarios that thrive on fast single-threaded performance. Gaming is also topping with this chip, which was to be expected given its aggressive clock speeds. It also has room to grow for future games with 16 threads on tap. And then there's also the addition of solder thermal interface material under the chip's integrated heatsink, a great move on Intel's part. It's allegedly not as great a solution as it could be, but it's still an important change, and a big improvement over last year's thermal pace that makes a CPU run at least 10 degrees hotter than it should. The biggest downside with the 9900K is its $500 plus price tag, but again, the chip has so much going for it, that it's not surprising to see Intel capitalize on it as much as possible. The great thing is that the 9700K exists, because it wouldn't be that far off the performance mark when run against the 9900K, and what it does shave off results in more than $100 in savings. Truthfully, I might find that to be the more alluring CPU from a value standpoint, but those opting for the biggest chip will get those tasty 5 GHz turbos right out of the box, and also some additional level 3 cache. It's great to see the CPU market bustling as it is. Both AMD and Intel are offering aggressive products, one way or another. In this case, you'll pay a premium for Intel to get the best performance or go with AMD to get improved value at the expense of weaker single-threaded and slightly weaker multi-threaded performance. One of the 30 or so graphs in this article should help you figure out which side of the fence you want to be on. Crucial P11TB Review When Crucial announced the P1, this whole lineup was meant to bring the QLC technology to consumers. Thus. It is unsurprising that we have retail packaging here. Even so, the P1 arrives in a pretty ordinary packaging. Solid state drives have never really come in fancy gamer oriented packaging yet, which I guess is a good thing. On the front, we have a navy blue shell, with some white accents. The top shows Crucial's logo, which is a Micron technology brand. Next to the lighter blue logo, we have a tagline of the memory and storage experts. Otherwise, the product name is found at the bottom with a description of NVMIM.2 solid state drive and a size of 1000 GB. There is a bit of inconsistency, as the product itself is called the 1 TB version, but the model number and the box show 1000 GB. Of course, they are not exactly the same but for the review we will be referring to it as the 1TB. 
If I were to answer the question at the beginning, I have to say the crucial P11TB is a jack of all trades SSD, combining a performance that is respective of its price, but this is not a bad thing in this case. From the start of our benchmarks, you would think this can be a competent performer especially with some of the numbers the P1 produced. Its sequential results and other synthetic numbers were very competitive. Even in more real-world simulated results that vary read and write performance, the crucial P11TB was in the middle to upper middle of our pack of SSDs. Furthermore, crucial offers a sufficient 5-year warranty coverage. However, the main thing holding back the performance is the quad-level cell NAND. Our lengthier consistency test revealed what performance was like when the drive started filling up and unfortunately, the numbers were not great. While they were still faster than other options like DRAMless SSDs in these workloads, the P11TB results dropped off when its write cache filled up. In addition, it still has a relatively low write endurance compared to the less dense NAND flash. However, if you put all of these results in the perspective that this is primarily a consumer SSD, I can say the crucial P11TB is a competent drive for those looking a larger capacity and decently fast SSD in their rig. Its rated endurance for the warranty period is still more gigabytes of write per day than most users will do anyways. When it comes to pricing, the crucial P11TB is priced relatively competitively at $S220. Flash memory pricing is only becoming more competitive, as you can find some better performing solid state drives getting close to this price per gigabyte, but this is also just the beginning of QLC. While the performance numbers may not necessarily peak as high, it is very good for a consumer drive under regular workloads and hopefully we will continue to see lower prices for these higher capacity drives. Seagate achieves milestone in ham HDDs, 16 terabytes units internally tested. Seagate has been hyping their new HDD density improvement technology, Hammer, for some time now. The basis of Hammer, heat assisted magnetic recording, in Seagate's upcoming HDDs is to increase platter density without having to resort to other solutions so as to increase HDD capacity, increase number of platters, increased footprint, etc. The company says that internal tests of 16 terabytes Hammer based HDDs are going well, with expected market release to partners by 2019. Hammer does keep up with compatibility for enterprise customers, being a drop-in upgrade for other HDD-based storage solutions, they're just higher capacity, higher performance solutions that don't need any special treatment from deployers. The plan is to release 20 terabytes solutions by 2020, and a staggering 48 terabytes in the standard 3.5 inches form factor by 2024. Seagate further states that hammer-based drives far exceed industry-required reliability parameters, so the company is bullish on the attention its technology will garner once available to customers in general. The hammer tech will be deployed firstly on the companies. Seagate has begun running early XOS hammer units through the full set of standard benchmark tests used to prepare and optimize each new hard drive product for deployment says Jason Feist, Seagate's Senior Director of Enterprise Product Line Management. Our testing has demonstrated the drive's compatibility for enterprise systems that are being used today. No system level changes are needed to run the hammer drives in these evaluations, or to deploy them in customer environments. German retailer MindFactory.de shows AMD outselling Intel 2 to 1 in November. AMD seems to be picking up steam over Intel's previous sky-high dominance of the desktop CPU market, Intel still dominates aplenty, really, but AMD has been clawing back market percentage monthly. The latest figures from the German retailer show shoppers taking advantage of AMD's newfound competitiveness in the CPU space, 
with increasing sales momentum starting on June 2018 up to a staggering 69% total AMD units sold against Intel's 31% during the month of November. All in all, this equates to around 16,000 CPUs sold by AMD just last month, and represents an almost two-fold increase in total number of AMD processors moved away by the retailer. Intel's ASP may be much higher than AMD's right now, which helps the company close the gap in earnings to a mere 12% difference, but the latter is likely betting on the greater perceived longevity of its AM4 platform to bring more consumers to their side of the field via market penetration strategy. It's all about rebuilding the competitiveness image at this time while racking in a steady profit from AMD's smart choices in processor design. A national European market does not a global one makes, of course, and while it may be a little over the edge to extrapolate this to the entire market, one thing is for sure, AMD is gaining market share. DICE prepares Battlefield VRTX, DXR a performance patch, up to 50% FPS gains. EA DICE and NVIDIA earned a lot of bad press last month, when performance numbers for Battlefield V with DirectX Ray Tracing DXR, were finally out. Gamers were disappointed to see that DXR inflicts heavy performance penalties, with 4K UHD gameplay becoming out of bounds even for the $1200 Force RTX 2080 T and acceptable frame rates only available on 1080p resolution. DICE has since been tirelessly working to rework its real-time ray tracing implementation so performance is improved. Tomorrow, 4th December, the studio will release a patch to Battlefield V, a day ahead of its new Tides of War, Overture and New War story slated for December 5th. This patch could be a game-changer for its Force RTX users. NVIDIA has been closely working with EA DICE on this new patch, which NVIDIA claims improves the game's frame rates with DXR enabled by up to 50%. The patch enables RTX 2080 T users to smoothly play Battlefield V with DXR at 1440p resolution, with frame rates over 60 FPS, and DXR reflections set to Ultra. RTX 2080 non T, users should be able to play the game at 1440p with over 60 FPS, if the DXR reflections toggle is set at medium. RTX 2070 users can play the game at 1080p, with over 60 FPS, and the toggle set to medium. NVIDIA states that it is continuing to work with DICE to improve DXR performance even further which will take the shape of future game patches and driver updates. ISO announces the FlexScan EV2457 monitor. ISO Corporation, TSE, 6737, today announced the release of the FlexScan EV2457, a 24.1-inch LCD monitor featuring a frameless and fully flat stylish cabinet design with DisplayPort daisy chain compatibility for improved work efficiency and style in the office. The EV2457, a 24.1-inch 1920x1200 resolution LCD monitor, has a frameless and fully flat design for improved multi-monitor use. With the super-thin bezels, Several monitors can be arranged side by side with minimal space between screens, improving work efficiency and saving space on the desk. Furthermore, the monitor comes in either white or black with matching cable colors, for a fully coordinated and stylish office. With DisplayPort 1.2 Daisy Chain compatibility, several monitors can be connected in a row using a single connection between each. This removes the need for an external docking station or MST hub on PCs with limited outputs. Furthermore, without the need for several long signal cables, cable clutter is reduced, leading to a neater and more work-efficient space. The monitor also comes with four USB 3.1 Type-A ports with 5V power supply, allowing several devices such as a mouse, 
keyboard, and or headset to be connected to the conveniently accessible monitor rather than the PC. The FlexScan EV2457 is also compatible with ISO's proprietary software screen in style, which lets users control multiple monitors at once, including synced brightness and power settings. An additional feature allows switching of the monitor inputs using user-defined hotkeys rather than the switches on the front of the monitor. A server app for screen in style gives an administrator control over the settings of all FlexScan EV2457 units in an installation from a central location. This is especially helpful for enterprises that want to ensure all units are adjusted properly and the power save settings are activated. NVIDIA releases GeForce 417.22 WHQL drivers. NVIDIA today released the latest version of GeForce software suite. Version 417.22 refines optimization for Battlefield V, with specific game-ready tuning for Battlefield V Tides of War Chapter 1, Overture Update. The drivers also introduce fixes to a number of bugs including display corruption noticed on some higher refresh rate monitors connected via DisplayPort, and a blank screen noticed on Bank's AUI XL 2730 monitors when the refresh rate is set to 144 Hz. A game crash noticed on Hellblade with RTX 2080 is also addressed. Also fixed are incorrect memory clock speed reporting, and incorrect application of RGB color formats in NVIDIA control panel. The changelog follows. Game Ready provides the optimal gaming experience for Battlefield V Tides of War Chapter 1, Overture Update. Fixed issues in this release display corruption may occur on higher refresh rate display port monitors upon resume from sleep mode. NVIDIA control panel. Incorrect overclocked memory clock is reported. NVIDIA control panel, incorrect memory data rate is reported. NVIDIA control panel, RGB color format does not get set correctly even when forced in the NVIDIA control panel. GeForce RTX 2080T Hellblade Sinuous Sacrifice, the game crashes. Microsoft Edge, the browser does not respond after playing a video. Bank's AUI XL 2730, the display shows a black screen when the refresh rate is set to 144 Hz. Valeroa, de novo competitor, overcome two days after City Patrol, police is released. We recently covered Valeroa, a tentative new entry into the anti-tamper tech industry. Valeroa tries to skirt the line of being called a full DRM solution with some non-intrusive choices in its design, which still remains much of a mystery. According to the company, only a handful of functions are protected by Valeroa, this technique doesn't even require an internet connection, it doesn't read or write the hard drive continuously and does not limit the number of daily installations or changes of hardware. The company's motto is that games with their protection cannot be cracked within reasonable time. Well, crackers took that as a challenge accepted type of claim, and took to City Patrol, police to test Valeroa's claims. The result was that the game was cracked just two days after release. Whether or not this means protection was assured for a reasonable time is something to be discussed between Valeroa, City Patrol. Police's publisher Toplets, the developer, Kpirina Games, and other companies that might be in the discussion table to use Valeroa's solution. This wasn't such a high-profile release, either, imagine this was a juicy target, such as any new AAA game, and it's likely the cracking procedure would have lasted even less time. Hyperx expands gaming accessory lineup. Hyperx the gaming division of Kingston Technology Company, Inc., today announced Hyperx Charge Play Quad Joy-Con Charging Station for Nintendo Switch and Hyperx Charge Play Duo Controller Charging Station for PS4. Charge Play Quad charges up to four Joy-Con controllers simultaneously and conveniently connects directly to the Nintendo Switch dock with a 2-meter USB charging cable. 
LED light indicators enable gamers to easily monitor charge status for each individual Joy-Con controller. Hyperx's first charging station for console, Charge Play Duo charges up to two DualShock 4 wireless controllers in two hours or less and includes a through-level indicator to monitor charging status. The Charge Play Duo quickly clicks into the dock without the hassle of trying to find ports, plug-in cables, or additional dongles to connect. Hyperx continues to expand and support console gamers with the new Charge Play charging stations, said Andrew Ewing, Senior Manager Console Business, Hyperx. As games like Red Dead Redemption 2 and Super Smash Bros. Ultimate continue to surge in popularity on consoles, the new Hyperx charging accessories enable gamers to keep their gear charged and ready for multiplayer and extended gaming sessions. Charge Play Quad and Charge Play Duo are released just as the holiday gaming season peaks with new and highly anticipated titles like Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, Red Dead Redemption 2, Call of Duty Black Ops 4, and Pac-Man Let's Go. A Charge Play Quad video is available to watch here. Hyperx Charge Play Quad is now available on Amazon and Hyperx Charge Play Duo Charging Station is now available through Best Buy and Amazon. Both are available for $29.99 MSRP. Elsa announces its touring-powered lineup in partnership with Inno3D. Elsa, who've been taking longer and longer to release their own branded interpretations of NVIDIA's graphics cards have now decided to partner with Inno3D to deliver their own branded graphics cards under the Turing Microarchitecture. Under the Powered by Inno3D branding, ELSA is announcing RTX 2070 and RTX 2080 graphics cards. The two models will be the RTX 2070 SAC, which features reference clock speeds in a dual fan, dual slot model that's 20.6 cm long. A blast from the past DVI port is present, alongside 2x display port, 1x HDMI, and 1x USB Type-C. The RTX 2080 is marketed as the Razer, featuring a dual fan, dual slot design as well, in a bigger package, 26.7 cm with an RGB bullying top shroud. There's also a mild overclock up to 1755 MHz. This card does away with a DVI connector in favor of a third display port connector, with the rest of the ports remaining the same as the RTX 2070 SAC. NVIDIA Physics now open source. NVIDIA Physics, the most popular physics simulation engine on the planet, is going open source. We're doing this because physics simulation, long key to immersive games and entertainment, turns out to be more important than we ever thought. Physics simulation dovetails with I, robotics and computer vision, self-driving vehicles, and high-performance computing. It's foundational for so many different things we've decided to provide it to the world in an open source fashion. Meanwhile, we're building on more than a decade of continuous investment in this area to simulate the world with ever greater fidelity, with ongoing research and development to meet the needs of those working in robotics and with autonomous vehicles. Physics will now be the only free, open-source physics solution that takes advantage of GPU acceleration and can handle large virtual environments. It will be available as open-source starting Monday, December 3rd under the simple BSD3 license. Physics solves some serious challenges. In I, researchers need synthetic data, artificial representations of the real world, to train data-hungry neural networks. In robotics, researchers need to train robotic minds and environments that work like the real one. For self-driving cars, Physics allows vehicles to drive for millions of miles in simulators that duplicate real-world conditions. In game development, canned animation doesn't look organic and is time-consuming to produce at a polished level. In high-performance computing, 
physics simulations are being done on ever more powerful machines with ever greater levels of fidelity. Physics SDK addresses these challenges with scalable, stable and accurate simulations. It's widely compatible, and it's now open source. Physics SDK is a scalable multi-platform game physics solution supporting a wide range of devices, from smartphones to high-end multi-core CPUs and GPUs. It's already integrated into some of the most popular game engines, including Unreal Engine, versions 3 and 4, and Unity 3D. NVIDIA presents the Titan RTX 24GB graphics card at $2,499. NVIDIA today introduced NVIDIA Titan RTX, the world's most powerful desktop GPU, providing massive performance for eye research, data science and creative applications. Driven by the new NVIDIA Turing architecture, Titan RTX, dubbed T-Rex, delivers 130 teraflops of deep learning performance and 11 giga rays of ray tracing performance. Turing is NVIDIA's biggest advance in a decade, fusing shaders, ray tracing, and deep learning to reinvent the GPU, said Jensen Huang, founder and CEO of NVIDIA. The introduction of T-Rex puts Turing within reach of millions of the most demanding PC users, developers, scientists and content creators. NVIDIA's greatest leap since the invention of the CUDA GPU in 2006 and the result of more than 10,000 engineering years of effort, Turing features new RT cores to accelerate ray tracing, plus new multi-precision tensor cores for eye training and inferencing. These two engines, along with more powerful compute and enhanced rasterization, enable capabilities that will transform the work of millions of developers, designers and artists across multiple industries. Designed for a variety of computationally demanding applications, Titan RTX provides an unbeatable combination of eye, real-time ray-traced graphics, next-gen virtual reality and high-performance computing. It delivers, 576 multi-precision Turing tensor cores, providing up to 130 teraflops of deep learning performance. 72 Turing RT cores, delivering up to 11 giga rays per second of real-time rate racing performance. 24 gigabytes of high-speed GDDR6 memory with 672 gigabytes per second of bandwidth. 2x the memory of previous generation Titan GPUs, to fit larger models and datasets. 100 gigabytes per second NVIDIA and VLink can pair two Titan RTX GPUs to scale memory and compute. Incredible performance and memory bandwidth for real-time 8K video editing. Virtual Link port provides the performance and connectivity required by next-gen VR headsets built for eye researchers and deep learning developers. Titan RTX transforms the PC into a supercomputer for eye researchers and developers. Titan RTX provides multi-precision Turing tensor cores for breakthrough performance from FP32, FP16, INT8 and INT4, allowing faster training and inference of neural networks. It offers twice the memory capacity of previous generation Titan GPUs, along with NVLink to allow researchers to experiment with larger neural networks and data sets. A powerful tool for data scientists, Titan RTX accelerates data analytics with Rapids. Rapids open source libraries integrate seamlessly with the world's most popular data science workflows to speed up machine learning. Titan RTX brings the power of real-time ray tracing and AI to creative applications, so 5 million PC-based creators can iterate faster. It also delivers the computational horsepower and memory bandwidth needed for real-time 8K video editing. AMD Ready's Radeon Adrenaline 2019 Edition, you can talk to your graphics card. AMD is preparing Radeon Software Adrenaline 2019 Edition, keeping up with the tradition of big year-end software launch that are high on new features. Video cards got a whiff of three of its key features. 
One of them is voice control. You will soon be able to talk to your graphics card through voice commands picked up from your microphone. Rolling out initially in English and Chinese, you will soon be able to control a lot of things while still in game and not having to take your hands off your keyboard, mouse. These include taking screenshots, telling the driver to record or stream your gameplay using Relive, adjust display settings such as brightness, contrast, and gamma, etc. It should also take commands to change resolution, rotate displays, move workspaces between multiple displays, etc. Enthusiasts can rejoice as Wattman could get an expanded feature set, including one click overclocking, similar to NVIDIA's Touring Ox scanner. This one click ock feature cranks up not just your GPU's clock speeds, but also video memory. The drivers also support fully automated undervolting, which should make several current generation Radeon graphics cards more energy efficient. Lastly, AMD seems to be compensating for NVIDIA's virtual link implementation by introducing a more advanced interface, direct streaming to VR headsets. Think Steam Link for VR headsets. Intel Glacier Falls platform likely gets a Computex unveil also B365 chipset. Intel's ninth generation rebranding of its Skylake X refresh head processors could have a rather short lifespan in the company's product stack of just three quarters. Intel is planning to launch its next head platform, codenamed Glacier Falls, which succeeds the current Basin Falls refresh. Glacier Falls could launch around late Q2 slash early Q3 with unveils slated for Computex 2019, June. These details are a part of a slide leak from an internal presentation from motherboard manufacturer Gigabyte. The slide revealing Glacier Falls also mentions two new mainstream desktop platform chipsets, the B365 Express and the H310C Express. There is no information on what sets these apart from the current B360 and H310, respectively. We predict their entry is necessitated by stronger CPU VRM requirements to support 9th generation Core 6 core and 8 core processor SKUs that are known to pull up to 140 watts of power, unrelated to TDP, which is calculated on the basis of nominal clock speed and not turbo boost. There's also a faint possibility of Intel giving the B365 CPU overclocking support to compete with the value proposition of AMD's B450. Intel readies KF variants of key 9th general core desktop SKUs. Intel is readying a curious looking KF brand extension for key SKUs of its 9th generation core Coffee Lake Refresh family. These SKUs include the Core i9-9900KF, the Core i7-9700KF, Core i5-9600KF, and the Core i3-9350KF. The source revealing slides from a Gigabyte internal presentation mentioning these doesn't explain what KF means, but we've heard rumors on what KF could mean. The K in KF denotes that the processor features an unlocked base clock multiplier. No points for guessing that one. The F, however, could indicate a disabled or physically absent IGPU. This won't be the first time that Intel has launched variants of its mainstream desktop premium SKUs with disabled IGPUs. Intel's reasons for doing so with Coffee Lake Refresh could be many including harvesting dyes with defective IGPU components. Physically absent IGPUs could only make sense from the perspective of increasing yields per wafer, as the dyes could be around 15% smaller for the 8-core silicon, and 25% smaller for the 6-core silicon. It doesn't make sense from a purely TDP optimization perspective, because Intel processors are capable of power gating, and not just clock gating. User Disabled IGPUS AMD 3rd Generation Resin Confirmed for Computex 2019 In a development that could explain why Intel is frantically stitching together 10 cores with the Comet Lake Silicon, 
A slide leaked from a private event hosted by motherboard Major Gigabyte reveals that AMD's third-generation Ryzen desktop platform could launch as early as Computex 2019, June. The platform will include AMD's first client segment processor based on its Zen 2 inches microarchitecture, codenamed Matisse, and its companion chipset, the AMD X570. Third-generation Ryzen with X570 is expected to be the world's first mainstream desktop platform to feature PCI Express Gen 4.0. AMD could maintain the processor's backwards compatibility with older 300 series and 400 series chipset motherboards by shaping its PCI Express implementation to use external redrivers based on the motherboard. This could make 500 series motherboards slightly pricier than current AM4 motherboards. Backwards compatibility could mean that unless you really need key Gen 4.0, you should be able to save money by opting for older motherboards.